Next, we have Tristram Stewart, the food campaigner, who is going to talk about why do we pay for waste. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. What an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about how to take on uh, what is one of the biggest challenges in the global food system, and that is um, waste. I um, will lay out, to start with, the fact that my ultimate goal is to tackle what I call the productionist paradigm in the food system. Um, and to do so, I need to have a strategy, a strategy that works for a general population, and a strategy that works for policymakers, and a strategy that works for corporations. Um, so the place in which I start is what I could call the Achilles heel, the vulnerable, very easily uh, exposable hypocrisy within uh, the food system, and that is the issue of food waste. What you can see here is uh, a photograph that I took on one of my recent research uh, investigations into the supply chains of European supermarkets. Um, this is around 1,000 tons of tangelos, of beautiful citrus fruit. It's in Peru. And all of these uh, fruits are being wasted because of minor cosmetic uh, imperfections. Uh, if you're having difficulty seeing what this guy is pointing out on the skin of uh, his tangelo, that's kind of the point. Uh, there's a very minor skin scar. And uh, as a result of these completely irrelevant, have no impact whatsoever on taste, or nutritional value or longevity of the fruit, uh, all of this fruit is being wasted. He tries to sell some of it locally, but the local demand for tangelos is not sufficient to soak up the sheer quantity of rejects from the export supply chains that he's mainly growing for. Um, of course, this isn't a problem just in Peru. We go around the world exposing uh, this problem. These are carrots grown in the UK. Most of these are being rejected and either being sent off to livestock feed, feed or being dumped in fields to rot because uh, they don't fit into the packets of the supermarkets. They're too long. So one of our strategies is really to pick on some of the most absurd examples of food waste, really as a way of prizing open the whole problem. Um, this is where we found one of the, those exact pinnacles that articulates the absurdity of our whole system. Um, I bring your attention to the word Kenya on this packet of green beans. These are grown in Kenya and then trimmed. But the funny thing about the way these beans have been trimmed is it's not just at the kind of tip and tail. Uh, we all know, you know, we don't eat the stalk bit of the green bean, right? But let's see a show of hands. Who eats the wispy little tail at the end? Some people do, some people don't, but you know, at least we can agree that if you're going to trim it off, you trim it off at the end of the bean. But these have been trimmed off not at the end of the bean, but halfway through. Why? Because that packet was exactly nine centimeters long, and the green beans didn't know they had to be nine centimeters long. So they grow all sorts of lengths. And these are the green beans that have won the race. They're the straightest, greenest, most beautiful beans. And then right at the end, 20% of the bean are being chopped off. And all of that is total wastage. There is no local market in Kenya for these green beans. They call it mzunga food. It's white man's food. Why should they eat it? And they're not interested. And um, so it all goes to waste. And the other problem that these Kenyan farmers that we speak to uh, regularly encounter is the problem of order cancellations. So there is a risk in the market. We can never exactly predict demand, how many green beans we're going to eat. Or indeed, Kenyans can't predict whether the Guatemalans will have a, bu a, a bumper crop, and therefore supermarkets here in Europe will want to buy their green beans at a cheaper price. And so what you often find is uh, ladies like this one growing on an acre and a half near Mount Kenya will spend their year uh, growing the crops, investing money in them, going to debt very often to buy the inputs to grow the crops. And then at the last minute, the order is cancelled. Um, and ironically, these are mange too and not one of these mange two will actually be manged, they will be um, wasted. She's not going to harvest any of it because the order was cancelled. These ladies, who work for less than $2 a day, are destroying an entire crop of basil because an order was cancelled. And they explain to us that on occasions like this, they don't get paid. Or they get paid half wages at best. They can't feed their kids. They can't send them to school. Now, these are in the supply chain of our supermarkets, and we are currently paying for it. Why? 
not a single person, I believe, in this room, or indeed in Europe, thinks that what I've just told you about is okay. And yet it goes on. So our attempt is to galvanize the public around this issue, both to reform the issue of food waste, but also to take on, as I say, the productionist paradigm and uh, to recalibrate the general trajectory of the food system. The first thing you've got to do is get your facts straight, which is why I wrote my book in 2009 on the issue of food waste. And the second is to make it very accessible to a wide population. And there is no better way of making food issues more accessible than through people's stomachs, getting them to eat it. So we started creating this format, feeding the 5,000, feeding 5,000 people or more with food that otherwise would have been wasted in celebratory ways that get people together around the simple solution to food waste, namely eating and enjoying it together rather than throwing it away. We've held these events in over 50 cities worldwide. This is one we did in, in Nairobi. And the other is to make it fun. So we take volunteers to fields where crops are being wasted. We get them to harvest it. Give it to charities that feed hungry people. This makes us pretty much unassailable from the corporations that we then take on in quite aggressive and confrontational ways because no one will stand up to a lady like this when she's, all she's doing is harvesting crops that are being wasted for no good reason and putting it to its proper purpose. We galvanize public opinion to the extent that they are willing to boycott or move away from certain businesses that are, in essence, acting against the values of their customers. And sure enough, that's when the corporations jump into action. Uh, Tesco was the first to do this. They stopped trimming the beans. This cut waste uh, by over 30% overnight. Translated across the sector, this could save $20 million worth of beans just in bean trimmings. And that represents about 0.04% of the entire Kenyan economy. How do we turn what really should make us angry into something that can spark a food revolution? Well, this made me angry when I first saw it in 2008. Remember, this is the food uh, crisis of 2008 when lots of people were going out without food. And in Britain, we're wasting bread like this. These are the crusts of sandwiches. Uh, the loaves in the factories, they throw around 13,000 slices of fresh bread from this single factory every day. So the final bit of our strategy is to make the solutions to this problem fun. And uh, what a better way to do that than get wasted on waste? We, um, we need money as well. We're a non-profit, and it costs money to go out to Peru and do investigations. So. At the moment, we rely entirely on donations. We can't take money from corporates for obvious reasons. Um, so my latest idea is to turn this waste bread that we collect and turn it into craft beer. Uh, the first ever bottle is being tasted there on Jamie Oliver's television program. That was nerve wracking. He really liked it, thankfully. And what better way to fund and generate a message, to put a message in a bottle and to say, really, the solution to this problem, the solution to the productionist system that, as Johan Rockstom has just eloquently pointed out, the productionist system that says we need to double food production by 2030 is the one that not only is factually incorrect, because we already grow enough food for 12 billion people, but it is the single biggest threat to long-term global food security, because it's undermining the environment or viability of our food system. So we've got to take that on. We've got to make it easy, we've got to make it fun, we've got to make it delicious. And frankly, we've got to have a better party than the corporations that are currently responsible for a food system that is destroying public health and destroying the planet. And it's by coming together with, well, the word companion really says it all. Companion literally means somebody you eat bread with, com is with, and pan is bread. And through companionship, by gathering together, as I hope we all have today, around common values, sharing food, and having fun. That's how we can flip what is currently an ecocidal system into, as Johan said, the biggest tool to combat climate change and environmental degradation. Thank you very much.